Hey everyone. So, my initial plan was to do a map of Norway today, but um, the plans have changed because I've actually booked a spontaneous trip to Norway and of course I'm going to go and try and find some great maps that maybe I wouldn't be able to find here. And instead I figured we could have a look at this cute little map that has fascinated me for a while. We're still in the north here, so not too far away. You can see here it says North Sea, so this is the North Sea. And we are along the German coastline. So a little further up we would get to Denmark. We would have uh, the Netherlands down here. And this specifically is the German bite. If we are perfectionists here, we might as well have a look at the entire area or, uh, or define where the German bite ends. So like I said, we have Denmark, Germany and the Netherlands. And then a little further out in the North Sea, we have Doggerland, which is a shallow region with a sandbank on the water. It sort of forms a natural border in the sea. It's quite an important area for Germany, especially here if we have a look at the Elbe. The Elbe Estuary. This is a river that comes from Hamburg and one of the most important uh, shipping areas of Germany. We are past Cuxhaven, which I think today is written with a C instead of a K. And if the map were a little bigger down here, we would find Bremerhaven and Wilhelmshaven, which are also two very important ports. For Germany. This specific map again is a bit older. It's from the Meyers Konversationslexikon, the sixth edition. I looked it up online and it was published sometime between 1902 and 1908, so over a hundred years old. And of course initially this was an entire lexicon, unfortunately only half. Unfortunately, I only have this one page without the accompanying article on the North Sea shoreline. But I still have a couple of things that I can tell you about this area. What we see, and I think what becomes quite obvious when you look a little more closely, is that this is an area where the water is quite shallow and where the specific conditions lead to a lot of changes in the coastline. These are largely areas of the Wadden Sea, meaning the water comes in with the tide and floods this place and then when it retreats you can actually take a walk out across the sand. A great deal of this area today is protected. These are natural parks, so it's only allowed to walk on foot. But there are also some ferries where it's possible and there are also some trains, especially a little further here in the north. Here's Sult. I think it's just Germany's northernmost island. Unfortunately, it's cut off here. But there's the Hindenburg Dam. It's a connection to the mainland that you can only cross by train and not by car. When it was built, interestingly, it led to some changes in the way the water can move here. And that is maybe the reason why Sult has some issues with losing land, especially here in the south. A 
lot of soot has to be sort of rebuilt every year because the water washes away the sun of the beaches. It's a very beautiful island though and quite popular um, as a little destination for a holiday. The part that I find the most fascinating though is right here. It says the Halling. And this is the reason I wanted to have a look at this card. So we have some actual islands in this region. There's Föhr, Amrun, Pelorm and Nordstrand but these small ones are not quite islands they are Hallige like Nordstrandisch Moor Südfall Süderug, Norderug Hoge Langenes, quite a large one Oland, Hamburger Hallig, and I think Harbour too. Upperland, I think, is an island. And the fascinating thing about these Hallig is that they can be almost completely flooded when the tide moves in, especially when there's a storm and the tide's higher. They are land unter. They go below the water. Not completely though. Because seven out of these ten Hallige are inhabited. There's about 200 people living there on the different islands. And they often have farms. So they will have chickens, cattle, sheep. And in order to be able to live there with their animals, They've built these Werften, or Terp in English. So those are areas where the ground's raised and which is safe when the water moves in. That's where the houses are built and the stables. And when there's a warning that the land's going under, there's one designated person on each island that goes from house to house and make sure that everyone's heard the warning and everyone makes sure to be safe. Uh, I didn't know about these areas at all until, I think it might have been during the first lockdown, I watched a documentary about life on these islands and I thought it was absolutely fascinating, if a little bit terrifying. They filmed as one of these tides were moving in and basically all you can do is just, you know, bring your chickens up and your cows and sheep then you sit in your house and wait for the water to go down again. There are no dikes usually so the land's not particularly protected from the water. However, there are no trees and if you have sheep, then they usually protect the soil a little bit um, by making it firmer, by walking across it. The other fascinating thing about the Hallige is there's no fresh water, or at least historically there wasn't. Today, of course, they are connected to the mainland, so you can just turn on your tap. But if you lived there a hundred years ago, you had to have a reservoir where you collected rainwater. Often there were two different ones, one for the animals and one for people. But of course there was always the danger that if you had a time of drought where there was no rain, or a particularly high tide that would push the sea into your reservoir, you would lose your water and they had to be brought in from the mainland. It also means that the ground is salty, which I thought was really fascinating. I had no idea that that existed. 
So these are salt meadows that you find in this area with specific kinds of plants and herbs that can grow there and you can also use them for cooking I'm really curious about that, I've never tried it but I'd love to someday If you look very closely you can see these red lines here on the map and that gives us an idea of how much the coastline has changed That's, the red line is the coastline in 1643 okay, that's a bit odd, or 1634 respectively so they've probably taken the information from two different maps and you can see that some areas were much larger, like here, Pelvon. Um, Langenes, in fact, was two different islands or two different Hallige before it formed in its current state. This part here, the Schweinsrücken, is now completely underwater while it was above water beforehand. You can see that fur has lost its loons on the area. In the west it's lost some ground, but it's grown in the east, in Osterland. Here we have Amrun, which has also been growing both on its western side and here in the north. And that's not only the islands. We can see here that the coast of the mainland has changed too. At some point it extended further into the marshlands and at some point a good deal of land has been laid dry. Here from Eiderstedt, a good deal of land has been lost to the sea. So here up to turning. Here we have the Wesselburner Cork. This is basically a dike that was built. And then the land behind it was laid dry. This was in 1862. And we have this kind of information all along the coastline. We have one here from 1800. Here are two older ones. This might be from 1600. It's with a teeny tiny question mark. This one's from 1693. Here in the north there is 1698, 1610. This one's even from 1554, so that's very old. 1529. These are also from the 16th century and then a new from 1861 again a bit of a mix here 1512 this is the oldest one we've seen so far and then 1767 1742 17 I think this is 88 so it's quite clear that a lot of work had to be done along the coastline in order to protect it before that, you often had the floods move in and uh, pose danger to the settlements here along the coast. How it's also how these Halige formed in the first place. Without the constant change, they probably wouldn't be here today. The sediments wouldn't have been brought in by the waves. But let's continue our journey down here. We have these corks, the dikes from 1800. Here again we can see a tiny island that's now part of the mainland. 1696. 
some loss of land near Busum. Today we have the Busumavat. Again, a summer cork. And then here we really have a substantial change. This entire area was under the sea and the island from 1648 is completely gone. And of course also here around Cook's Half it's changed. This is also quite fascinating, I think. This part here was land and today is actually part of the deepest uh, dredge in the Elbe. Of course, here the Wattenmeer or Wooden Sea poses some problem considering this is the busiest shipping channel for Germany. And they usually have to be dredged up to make sure that they are deep enough for the larger vessels that move into Germany, which of course is a very important harbour. If we look at the depths of the different colors, we can see that the very light one is just 0 to 4 meters. The lightest blue is 4 to 6 meters. Then we get to 6 to 10. We get a bit of a darker blue, 10 to 20. And only the darkest areas with these little dots in the blue are over 20 meters deep. So that would probably, there's really only these small bits like here in the middle of the Elbe that are over 20 meters. Largely it's between 10 and 20. But then here for example you have the Osterbank or Osterriff, Böschbücken that then are very, very shallow and I imagine not easy to navigate. Out here you have the Eider Leuchtschiff. So this would be not a lighthouse but a light ship. I haven't been able to find any information on that, whether that still exists, but that sounds quite fascinating. And then you can see that there's all of these little connections towards the coastline but it's rather impossible to just sail across probably. They must have been quite well documented though since they all have names. It's the Norda Elbe, the Falsches Tief, the False Depth, the Flagstrom, Mittelplatte, Blauortsand, Dofifaden, that's a bit of a funny name, the Eider, Norderpiep and Süderpiep. You have Norder, Mittel und Alte Südereider, so this would be the old Southern Eider. There must be a new one here somewhere, but I can't see it. We have the Franzosenloch, a French hole. Rachelstedt, Süderhever, Midland, Altehever. So Alte might just refer to Middle and South, maybe. It just means that it moved. And here then the southern one is the oldest part of the Ida, which then moved north. Again we have a Schmartie and the Alte Schmartie. 
to a narrow depth that moved across time. And I think that gives us a really good impression of how difficult it must have been and how much the glacier changes. The water basically in the North Sea is moving northwards here. And there's not really any tide that's created in the North Sea per se. It's the tide that's coming in from the Atlantic, since the North Sea is quite uh, protected from the three sides. But of course you have water coming in from the channel, and then you're going north and back out into the Atlantic. Up here we then have Suda Hour and Norda Hour. The Fortrap Tief, Eidum and Vernum Tief. If you try to move towards the islands or the Halliger by foot or maybe by carriage, you of course also had to know where these depths were. Today here you have a dam so you can walk across, or today, a hundred years ago. <laughs> You could already move across the dam. But before that, you had to know that this was safe to cross. But a little further south, you had the... the oh, let me see what that says. You had the Heverstrom with some depths that might have been difficult or dangerous to cross. Here you have one of the rivers coming out into the wooden sea, which then turns into this little stream here near the cutting of it. And the water moves out, presumably here, maybe across the Franzosen. Now you might think course it would be easier if this were a little more regulated and the coastline would maybe be more protected. But the uh, both the Hallige and also the Wooden Sea actually are important areas. For example for birds and for nature in general. And they do protect the coastline too. So this is quite a safe system that's been developed here. Interestingly, the people living on the Hallige often also work in coastal protection. So not just farms. And then of course you have tourism in the area. Not just on Sud, but also a little further south here. Personally, I've only seen Surt out of the places here, and I thought it was really, really beautiful. Again, for me, this was quite a different landscape. And really interesting. I wish I had known about the salt marches and salt meadows then when I visited. I would have tried to pick some of these salty herbs. Here we can also see we're in the Deep Martian and Friesland and Frasia. This is the northern part. And for official festivities, you might actually be able to hear a speech in Frasia. which was also fascinating to me when I first heard it because it sounded very, very different and strange. And I've also mentioned before that here in this area, Südschleswig and Holstein, you have a lot of northern influence as the 
border to Denmark has not always been here in the north but has been a little contestant and has shifted across this region of course for me it's a little difficult to tell whether the names are um, region in origin or from the North German dialects or actually Scandinavian in history it's a little too distant for me to be able to tell the difference I think it's a really beautiful part of Northern Europe though and really really fascinating and maybe if you have a chance you can visit these Heilige and see for yourself how they just sit in the sea and sometimes simply disappear for today I think that's enough exploring I hope you sleep well wish you sweet dreams and I'll see you again next week